Hey guys, uh, wanted to bring this really nice knife to you here today. <clears throat> it is a uh, beautiful uh, four and seven eighths of an inch eight blade sportsman's knife. And you can see this has a um, regular jack design to it. <clears throat> and um, just a really, really pretty look knife. Look at that bone. Nice, uh, deep cross-stitch pattern to it. Brass uh, bolsters, which are really nicely done. Look at the rounds, just perfect on that. As you go around that knife. And uh, they're not really too wide. So um, this knife is uh, well made. If you look at the uh, pins, uh, they're not too terrible there. It's nice and um, the other thing is if you open this knife up real quick and you look down in here let's see let's zoom in on it you can see that the dividers are um, milled I'm not really sure you would call that milling it's a uh, I don't know. Um, adds an aesthetic uh, appeal to the knife, though, and you can see the um, the uh, back of the back springs are nicely polished, and it's a nice, nicely done on the uh, tangs. The uh, if you notice the uh, top notches here. Are, uh, you can still see the uh, cut marks in those, so those weren't finished off. But overall, pretty nice job on this uh, knife. So, um, uh, as I put in the introduction, this is a mystery knife. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to use it as an educational knife review. And uh, we're going to learn a little bit about uh, how we can figure out who made these knives, where they came from and uh, what time frame they were made in and I'm going to show you how I do that and um, if you open this knife up you can see here I think you can see the Mickey light is kind of getting it there you can see Amiki a M E I K E in a three leaf clover, which would be a shamrock. And um, so uh, Goins does have a listing for this knife. If you um, if you go to Goins, it listed as uh, a Miki clover on the tang. And he guesses that it was made between 1890 and 1920, uh, uh, which would have been my guess when I look at this knife. Um, when I first got this knife, um, I thought this was uh, German made, possibly Pakistani because of the brass here. And um, the build on this knife it just looks a lot like uh, late 1800s, um, early um, 19, uh, 20th century. And um, that would have been my guess and was my guess right away. But um, if you look at the uh, can opener here, this is a blade style can opener. It's a uh, common to uh, uh, Europe, Europe. Uh, you see a lot of French knives with this blade, but uh, other countries as well used it. And you can see it in America too, but this is prominently a, uh, a, a European style blade um, can opener. The, uh, it has a cap lifter on it. So um, bottle caps came about 1880. 
Uh, so um, that would be the base date for this knife. It couldn't be any earlier than 1880. And um, I don't think it's that early. But at any rate, um, that's the things you look at and, and how you bracket a time frame on the knife. You're looking for something that you can uh, pin a date to. The can opener uh, cap lifter is a date we can uh, set a base date to. So, um, if, if you look at this jigging, it's a kind of irregular cross stitch pattern. It's pretty deep. And so, um, you know, Germans uh, had really deep, aggressive uh, jigging on their bone. And uh, so did the English. Um, but the build quality of this knife is not um, consistent with uh, an English build. And so um, if you look at this knife here, this is a Richardson and Southern um, sportsman's knife. And it's just a lot higher quality than this knife. And so it's not that this is a cheap knife or that it's... Uh, poorly built it's just the germans would build something really well and then they cut corners like they would uh not finish off those top squares and uh other things about this knife that you could point out um but it is if you look at the bone it's nicely rounded it, it melds into the liner there you see that so it's it's a nice quality job on this knife and um a lot of things about this knife, um, the uh, punch, if you look at that punch, it, um, you know, is an early punch design. The way that they put these grooves in here, like that, so they're decorating it. Uh, there's no reason to have those grooves. It's just a, a decoration. That's things that they did, um, you know, early in the 20th century to um, spice up uh, a knife but um, so I took this knife and um, did a lot of research on it uh, I did a um, uh, I looked at that trademark I looked at Germany Sweden uh, France Spain uh, India Japan uh, America, I could not come up with uh, a listing for that trademark. So um, it remains a mystery. And uh, then I did a uh, search, uh, etymology search on Amiki, and uh, that name is uh, largely prominent in Nigeria. So like 96% Nigerian. Uh, so that doesn't really help us. They're not really well known for making knives, but um, that's the etymology of the name. Um, so um, you have to try to figure out another way. If you can't um, pin this down on the internet through uh, some other type of searches, you just have to uh, start looking at how the knife is built. And um, I went to some knife forums um, on blade forum I saw a guy who uh, said this knife uh, was produced by the Japanese and came into the United States after World War II and uh, he said in his little blog there that uh, he had no proof of that and and uh, so he threw that right out there um, and then another guy said these knives were um, came into the United States in the 60s, and were used in Vietnam. So uh, I'm a former Marine, uh, and this is the knife we used, utility knife we used. These came out actually in 1944 and later became standard issue. Um, and that's the knife they would have carried to Vietnam. It's kind of a scout pattern knife, and, um, you know, you wouldn't carry this. This thing weighs 9.4 ounces. It's just too heavy to carry around in a pack. It would have been one of the first things you uh, got rid of. And if you 
bought this as an American before you went over to Vietnam, you would have ditched this thing right away. It's just too damn heavy uh, to carry. So, um, the little bit of blogs we have really don't help us. Uh, maybe it's Japanese. But um, I think the reason guys say this knife is Japanese is because of this knife. Uh, these knives are uh, fork spoon combo knives, hobo knives, that came into the United States in the um, 50s and 60s. And um, if, if you look at that pattern, cross stitch pattern, you know, it's, um, it's similar, isn't it? Right? Kind of looks like it. Um, but it's a lot different. You know, so if you look here on the uh, transitions on this uh, handle, they just flat ground this all the way across. And you have this big ridge here. And it's sharp here. And over here you have a nicely uh, rounded uh, um, scale like you should. And um, this knife has um, cheap um, tin bolsters. So they're very thin. It's just tin. And um, this is, if you look at the pins on this knife, they're very irregular. They stick up. You can see that they stick up. They're not well done at all. Um, the metal is not finished on the back. You can see that. And um, throughout, the knife is just very cheaply made. These are cheap knives. And um, this and this are two totally different knives. Um, another example, this is a camping knife that came in the United States 60s, 70s. And probably up to 2000. This is a German knife. And again, you can see the German construction. Um, typical, you know, nicely formed bolsters on here. Um, the sides are on the scales are rounded over to meld into the liner like they should. Transitions on the bolsters are good. But this is that 10, cheap 10 bolster. And, um, you know, the back is a little finished, but not mirror polished and um cheap uh um probably carbon steel uh bail on this so this is these were just meant to be you know cheap imports for camping and um that's not the knife we're looking at so Goins, when when he lists this knife as being from uh, 1890 to 1920, Amiki, he doesn't describe what knife he was looking at. So he just says, he describes a tank stamp and leaves it at that. So you have no idea what knife he was looking at. If he had said um, that this that it a uh, Mickey in a clover was a tang stamp on an on a uh, large uh sportsman's knife it'd be a slam dunk but he didn't say that and so we really don't know what knife he was looking at and uh, maybe it was this knife maybe it was something else okay but um all all that you look at on this knife uh, the bail um the pins, the type of can opener, the type of punch, everything on this knife um, speaks to an early date for this knife, at least uh, early 20th century. Um, but uh, that said, when you look at the tail of this knife, you see right there, there's a spacer there. And that spacer is plastic. So um, I've never really seen a knife from the, the early 1900s that had a plastic spacer on it. But <clears throat> if we look at this German knife and you look at the, um, the uh, tail of the knife or the head of the knife, you see a plastic spacer there. See that? And if you look at the tail, it's got two plastic spacers. 
So, <clears throat> you know, they're doing this to save money. Normally that would be metal. Um, but they're putting those in there to make it smoother on the rounds, close the ends up a little. And um, normally that would be metal and they're using plastic. So it, it's, a, it's a way to save money and provide a lower cost knife. And um, for me, <clears throat> that's the nail in the coffin on this knife. Uh, so I'm about 70% sure that this knife, the, these style Miki knives, were uh, made in Germany, at least Europe. It could be French, um, but I really think it's German. And um, you see the spacer there is consistent with the other German knife I showed you. And um, I don't think this is an early American knife. I think it's probably uh, late 60s. 70s or maybe even further out to the 80s. I just think it's a well-made German import knife. Um, the Germans uh, for a long time uh, have sent knife parts to Pakistan to have Pakistanis put them together and that could be why it's brass here. Um, I don't know. But it is a well-made knife. I do know that. And uh, I'm 70% sure this is German and that it dates to the 70s. Um, <clears throat> now, this could be a German knife. Maybe one of you guys has some uh, concrete evidence to present to prove that these knives were made in uh, Japan. That would be great. You know, I'm not married to my uh, opinion on this knife. In fact, I'm still open on it. So I'm not stopping. And uh, I look, uh, when I have a knife like this, that I can't identify it's a mystery knife. I continue to look at things to try to identify it over time. But that's kind of the logical pattern that you go through and that you can go through to identify uh, a knife. Uh, these knives are full of clues. Each country built a knife a little different. The blades on the knife may have different characteristics that are characteristic to a particular country. So you can nail down a country of uh, origin. Um, the way they put these knives together, how they made them is different practically every decade. And um, that would indicate a, um, a time period for your knife. Um, the biggest lesson that you, you have to learn from this video is this knife looks for all intents and purposes as a knife that was produced late 1800s, early um, 1900s. The only exception to that is this round bolster. That's kind of unusual, but uh, the French actually, you know, they put round bolsters on a lot of knives. And, um, but most of the French knives have square, most of their sportsman's knife have square bolsters. So um, I don't think it's French, but um, that's just an example of how you can trace the lineage of a knife based upon how it's built and, and uh, put together. Um, and the lesson is, even though this looks like an old knife, it really isn't. And it's really hard to definitively tell the date of a knife. Um, it's still, this knife is still 50 years old. But it's not 130 years old, I don't think. So I hope you found the uh, video informative. I hope you guys um, uh, really liked it. If you did, go ahead and like it. And um, if you'd like to see more content like this, uh, go ahead and share it uh, or subscribe. And uh, remember, you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. And I really appreciate you for watching it.